addition of the aligning towers, the tunneling could go on without fear of the headings missing each other. But the hand drilling was still very slow. When they first started building the, the tunnel, they used hand drills to make the holes in the, in the rock. They were star drills where you know, one man held the drill and another man hit it with a sledgehammer. Uh, you can imagine how, how long it took to drill a hole. Eventually, a man named Burley, uh, who was from uh, Fitchburg, developed what was known as the Burley drill. It was actually a series of drills usually mounted on a carriage, and they worked by compressed air. To make the compressed air, they built a what they called the compressor house, and upstream from the compressor house, about a quarter of a mile, they built a dam. They dug a canal between the dam and the compressor building and routed the water from the river down the canal and then used the, the fall of the water or the head to run air compressors in the compressor building that uh, made the compressed air that was then piped through uh, pipes into the tunnel and connected to the, the burly drills on a carriage. And uh, it greatly improved the, the efficiency of the drilling and blasting operation. While the compressors worked well, they were far from perfect. Relying on the flow of the water from the deer field, and with the water levels always fluctuating, sometimes the compressors didn't receive enough water to make them work efficiently sort of a controversial thing because the idea was that okay we'll use steam uh, part of the year but we'll have free water power the rest of the year but you had to build this canal you have to maintain the uh, compressors uh, I mean the, you have to maintain the dam and, uh, and you still have to have the, the steam plant on standby while you're using the, the free water uh, so there is there are arguments uh, both ways. And you can still see some remains of that uh, right near the, uh, the bridge that crosses the river for the trains. This building had a bad fire in about 1899 and uh, was never rebuilt, although there's still quite a bit left. Uh, the tur three turbine pits and uh, one of the walls is still here, as well as the back side wall and the back wall. But uh, the main front wall has long since collapsed. While there's not much of the old dam, a large stone retaining wall, several old rotten timbers, a handful of iron bolts, and the cuts into the stone, it's still an interesting place to visit, and easy to get to, as it's along a state catch and release zone. Just be courteous of the neighbors living nearby. That's a good probably 15 or 18 feet high. The crest of the dam was about 250 feet and it developed 800 horsepower. And it was a good 100, 150 feet long and it was in three terraces that were covered over with wood to uh, prevent the ice from uh, doing too much destruction during the winter time. As for the sluiceway, the ditch still remains. However, most of it lies on private property and can't be accessed by public routes. While the compressors were working on the east side, something else was developing on the west. He saw an ad in a magazine, Scientific American, for uh, a new product called trinitroglycerin made by a gentleman, uh, George Mombre. Mombre came from western Pennsylvania and started mixing up his, quote, soup in 1866. And that was certainly a, a significant engineering event, the, the beginning of the use of the nitroglycerin. Another significant engineering achievement was the development of the detonator. One of the uh, most dangerous things about blasting was when you had what they call missed holes where you had maybe 30 holes and 29 of them went off and one didn't. And then the uh, miners went back in and they discovered 
what didn't go off by the hard way because it exploded when they were in the vicinity and you know, there were numerous uh, casualties because of that. So inventing the, uh, an exploder that was delicate enough to uh, be set off by an electric spark but not so sensitive to um, that it would be set off by say a lightning bolt was, was very tricky and that's basically what my great grandfather did with uh, his, his patented uh, exploder which was very uh, reliable and effective and they built, I estimate at least 90 percent of the exploders used in the construction of the tunnel and I think these numbered in the hundreds of thousands. The acid works they built, it was built over on the west side of the mountain. Uh, Mulberry had a, set up a, a manufacturing facility there to make the nitroglycerin. And of course it was very dangerous. Uh, and it was dangerous not only to make it, but it was dangerous to move it and to get it into the, uh, into the tunnel so it could be used. Up until this point in time, it was believed that nitro was most stable at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But there was there was one little one little thing about the dam at East Portal that that needs to be mentioned is that that's the way they discovered that uh, nitroglycerin does not explode when it's frozen because they went over there. Uh, Granger went over there one day. He was he, he was one of the chief engineers and uh, he went over there to break up the ice that was impeding the flow of water to the compressor building and he, he very carefully uh, wrapped his nitroglycerin from the plant in North Adams in blankets to keep it warm and he went out there on the dam and, and set the nitroglycerin and fired off the exploders and the nitroglycerin never went off and that's how they discovered that that when frozen uh, it was possible to explode it. With the advent of nitroglycerin, progress increased greatly, on the east side at least. The west was still working on the portal situation. What they actually ended up doing was um, making this huge canyon and um, laying a, a foundation of brick and building a, a brick, basically a brick tube like a subway tube, and uh, then filling in around it. The brick factory was right up on the hill. They just made bricks by the, by the millions. Basically, that's why the tunnel costs about five times as much as it was projected, is because of all the difficulties at the, at the West End that were not, not anticipated. Due to all the additional work being done at the West Portal, Along with the failure of the boring machine and interest being paid on loans, the cost for the tunnel at this point in time was almost five times its original estimate. After Thomas Doan left in utter frustration and disgust, uh, the Hoosig project hung in the air over the Commonwealth, over the legislature, very, very similarly to the way the, uh, the big dig has hung over the, uh, the Massachusetts legislature in the, in the late 1990s. It virtually brought the State House in 1868 to an absolute dead halt. Nobody could get a majority to do anything. In a fit of a combination of, of uh, desperation, the Antis went along with the idea to put the entire project out for public bid. They figured that uh, nobody would be able to bid the job and they could influence the bid specs. And the big spec they had in there was that somebody would, uh, the successful contractor, would have to put up a bid bond for half a million dollars and that would in essence kill the project because nobody could do it. But they were in for a surprise. For in 1868, Francis and Walter Shanley of Toronto, Canada came to finish the project. They were awarded the contract but on several conditions. They had to do it for under five million dollars and they had to have it completed by March 1st, 1874. When they started in at Hoosick, they really brought professional project management to, uh, to the Great Boar for the first time. They built additional uh, housing and a school for the uh, miners' children and so on at the East End. I'm standing in one of the foundation holes 
up on the hill of the uh, shanty houses that uh, were up here for the miners and their families. As you can see, it's pretty well defined, and there's a few other holes along the uh, hillside that uh, are not as well defined, but still easy to see in the photographs. In addition to the housing on the east side, a dam was built at the Twin Cascades waterfall. This is an area about a quarter of a mile away from the east portal where two streams merge. Piping was run down to the village that was at the east portal. This supplied endless fresh water for the workers and their families. And if a miner was uh, killed or injured on the job, they, uh, they helped take care of his widow and his family. The men respected them very much for doing so. It was not really the way, uh, the average way things went, a hundred and almost forty years ago now. Uh, and accordingly, Shanley's got more, more work out of the men uh, by treating them fairly and, and, uh, and honestly. With the combination of newer and better equipment, better overall working conditions, and general contractors with great knowledge of tunneling, the bore progressed swiftly. The project continued to grind along, but between the Shanley's management practices and the an organization, and Mr. Mowbray's trinitroglycerin, Mr. Doan's realignment, and uh, Mr. Burley's drills, uh, finally in December of 1872, uh, the the heading broke between the central shaft and the east end, and then of course uh, uh, the following Thanksgiving Day, November 27th. 1873, the Great Boar was finally, quote, holed through, unquote, as the uh, newspaper headlines proclaimed. After this, the Shanleys left, and it was up to others to trim the hole through the mountain to the proper size, lay the tracks, and put it in operation. Finally, 24 years after its start, and 15 to 18 million dollars over its initial estimate, the Hoosick Tunnel was open for service, with a work train being the first official train through, February 9th, 1875.